So, yeah, I just need yeah, the okay, to use, and we have until lunch, and now it's to half past. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this morning, when we were talking, I said my only worry is that people may get hungry when I'm talking. And that's now even more the case, I think. But that's just the reality you have to uh, cope with. Um, I was also sort of struck by, by Sheila's distinction between planning and preparation. And I woke up this morning knowing that I had uh, sort of over-planned and have been confused about what to do. And I've decided not to show you the, the PowerPoint I, I made, but only the pictures in the PowerPoint. So that's what you'll see in the background. And I'll talk, talk through it, and I'll see how it works out with time. I have a title, Putting the World Back in the Center. And this morning, I was looking for the room where we're, we're supposed to meet. And I thought I had found it, and there was a big banner there in the room. We are the controls experts, control monitoring <laughs> intelligence optimization. That's the next room. So if you, if you want to go for that, they have the answers. But we are here together to be deep in the trouble for a while. And I think that's, uh, that's good. Um, so the challenge is interesting, but it's also wonderful to have something that's open in form and, and sort of in, in orientation and, and theme. Um, and it's also interesting to be sort of in, in, in unfamiliar territory, because I'm at home in education and not at all in mental health. <coughs> Although you have sort of very generously tried to pull me in a little and show me all the, the, the problems inside the whole area of, of mental health. And I, th I think we, we found common concerns there, and that's a really interesting way to work together from very different sort of, not just disciplines, but actually uh, domains of practice. And I think mental health and education are, are fundamentally domains of practice. Um, what I have prepared are sort of three bits of reflection that I, I want to put on the table to see whether that's useful for our coming conversations. Um, but before I do that, because I may run out of time, I was also thinking, is there a very short way in which I can capture what I want to say? And it's this. Um, it's a campaign I'm sort of starting everywhere I can, and I, I started it. Uh, half a year ago when I was asked to give a talk in a big European program uh, against radicalization of young people. And of course, there are all, all kind of clever people who have all kind of theories and thoughts. Um, and then I said, well, maybe it needs to start somewhere from here, that we should give uh, every child a, a rabbit. And why is that important? It's important for a number of reasons. First of all, rabbits are real. You cannot deny that. Rabbits have their integrity, uh, which means that when you encounter a rabbit, you encounter a reality that is not interested in your thinking. But it's a reality that asks something from you and where you actually find that there is something at stake, because if you don't care for the rabbit, it will not go well with the rabbit. And for me, this little idea already raises many questions about the difference between encountering reality or encountering your ideas of reality. The whole question of, of thought and reality and meeting a reality that actually is immune for your thinking, but that appeals to you. And I think somewhere in this, this image, there is a lot of what I'll try to say in some slower steps theoretically. And partly this is funny, and partly for me it's, it's really very serious. I, I did something similar at a big conference on early childhood <laughs> education, and I think that whole field is completely lost because it's sucked into all kind of psychological theories about well-being, social, emotional development, and so on. And it forgets that to, uh, 
to exist is to, to, to live a life, as Tim was also saying. So it, it misses, you can say, the most obvious and shoots in all kind of corners that actually forget what, what should be at the, the center. Um, and I actually think that a lot of uh, therapies that try to help children could be replaced by just giving them an animal and see what happens there. Um, so then <clears throat> I want to say a few things in relation to this. Um, this person, Filippo Brunelletti, I think it's called, because I was triggered by a very nice uh, little phrase in the announcement of uh, the, the two days where I was labeled as the one doing existential perspectives. And Bart at some point asked me, is this text fine? And I thought, yeah, it's really fine because there is an imperfection in it that I can use for my talk <laughs> that has everything to do with perspectives. Um, Filippo Brune, well, he is um, credited in the history of uh, drawing as the person who sort of invented or discovered perspective drawing. Um, and he did that in all kinds of clever ways with the drawing of the, the baptistry of the a big church in Florence. And he actually made a drawing and then he put a hole in the drawing and then he said, if you look through the hole in a mirror and you look back at the drawing, does it give you the impression of, of three dimensions? So he really started the whole thing of, of perspective drawing. Um, now, when you look at that history, you can say in art or in drawing or in painting, you can say what happens here is a, a technical step forward. So we have these Egyptians. Yeah, they can draw a little bit, but they don't really get it. And suddenly someone gets it and we have drawings that have perspectives and that you can say give us reality as we really experience it in 3D. Um, and you see that happening over time. This is an, a famous Dutch painter, Sarendam, who really works with perspective well. So you, you see that emerging in modern art. Although I, I also think Maurits Escher should be in the picture here, who begins to play with this whole question of, of perspective. Um, what does a perspective mean? It means that it's not just a, a depiction of what's outside of you, but a perspective also um, creates a position for the observer. So in, in the picture on the left, you can be anywhere as an observer. But when a picture has perspective, it creates that position for the one who observes. So in one move, you can say you have a field that can be observed and a position from which you view that field. And I'm making some big claims because we, we don't have a lot of time, but I think that this actually is the, the dualism of modernity. I'm not too fussed about mind-body dualism. I think it's overrated even as something to complain about. But this, this distinction between an observer and a world to be observed, I think that characterizes a, a really interesting step where you can say maybe that's something of modernity. And I need to say a bit more about it. And you can say it, it's an important step because it creates a position for the individual. And in that way, it, you can say it, it does something with our understanding of freedom, where you can say suddenly the individual has a clear position to exist in his or her own freedom. And you can say that's the gain of this step 
because in the Egyptian one, you can say there is no position for individuals to be. They are everywhere or, or nowhere. So in the perspective, you gain that position of freedom. But there is also a loss, because with that gain of, of a position where you can exist, the world itself turns into an object and you as an observer of that world. So it's the gain of, of freedom and the loss of, of the world. You can say the world becomes perspective and we, we were talking about world view, for example. That brings me to Martin Heidegger um, who, I think, well, Heidegger was always, if you know philosophy, a bit of a problem because he was a bad guy and it's always nice to say, oh, here we have a bad guy and then we don't have to engage with him. But I think actually it makes the challenge of engaging more interesting. Um, Heidegger has a, a, a brilliant little essay called the the age of the world view, the Zeit des Weltbildes. Um, because you could argue that this idea of an observer and a world to, uh, to observe is a modern view of the world. And we talk about that, a modern world view where we see the world as a big mechanism, for example. But Heidegger has a more interesting claim where he says actually what is modern <coughs> is the very idea of a worldview. The very idea that the world is something that can be viewed. Uh, and I find that interesting as well. So he, he says, there are no pre-modern worldviews. We cannot talk about the Greek worldview because that idea of someone viewing something is itself modern. So this is not about how we picture the world since modernity, but he says it's, it's the world grasped as picture. Um, and there you can say the idea of perspective, which we use very easily nowadays when we say, well, we have different perspectives. Um, there was something earlier on that I think we should come back to in, in the conversation. That idea that we can treat the world in terms of perspectives, Heidegger would say, that's, that's the modern step. So the world then becomes a, a picture, a thing to be viewed, and the individual becomes the observer of, of that world, the one who has a perspective on the world. Um, and although there is something good about it, this possibility for someone to have a perspective on something, the trouble is that the world itself begins to disappear. As soon as we talk about perspectives, we actually have given up on the world. You can also say that the individual becomes disconnected from the world because the world is out there for the individual to look at, but the individual is not in the picture. Um, and I'm putting this on the table because I think this whole question of reality is, has something to do with this history um, and with the, the gains and the losses there. Um, If you are into philosophy, and I'm sometimes into philosophy, you can find a lot of this in modern philosophy. Um, for example, the obsession of modern philosophy with epistemology, with the question, how can I really get knowledge about the world? That in itself is a modern question. It doesn't exist in, in Greek philosophy. Um, Immanuel Kant, gets quite excited about this, where he makes this bizarre claim that the things in themselves cannot be known. Um, 
And I think he works himself up in, yeah, starting from particular assumptions and then he ends up there. But actually you can say it's quite a bizarre claim to say that we, we cannot know the things in themselves. Um, but Kant is not the only one. And again, I think in that history you find constructivism that says knowledge is constructed. You can find radical constructivism that actually says the only thing we can know are our constructions, but not the world beyond our constructions. And when you look at, at contemporary neuroscience, there are people who claim that nothing from outside can enter the brain, which sort of anatomically is true, but existentially is a disaster to make that claim, to say nothing from outside can enter inside. So even in neuroscience, where some people say this is the, the most exciting science we have, there is something really worrying about disconnecting the individual from the world. So you can say these are philosophical problems, but I also think these are the urgent problems that we are in the middle of. Um, Post-truth is only possible if you are a perspectivist. Because then you can say, yeah, we all have a different perspective. And this becomes politicized by saying, and we all have the right to our own perspective. And if my perspective doesn't make sense to you, well, let's do an election and see how the percentages pan out. And then we'll see which perspective wins. So I think there you see the one problem. I think the the modern concern with identity is the same, because identity is the perspective we have on ourselves. And that creates problems in identity politics. I also think this is one cause of a lot of mental health problems in young people who are being told you need to find out who you are. You need to get absolute certainty about your perspective on yourself, which is an impossibility. But it comes out of the same. I think the ecological <coughs> crisis, where we no longer see the world as a, as a thing with an integrity, but as a resource, comes out of perspectivism. Um, the, the conflation of values with preferences comes out of perspectivism. So values have become subjective. It's not about what what should have value and how we position ourselves in relation to that. But we think, what is the value? Well, that's my preference and you have other preferences and we evaluate on the basis of our preferences. So values are not objective, but subjective. Yeah, we like rabbits or we don't like rabbits, but that the rabbit itself poses a value that we need to come into relationship uh, disappears from that way of, of relating to the world. So that is my, my first bit on perspectivism, where the subject gains a position, but it's a position outside of the world, and the world itself disappears. And, and for me, this, this helped me to get into the whole topic of what, what's happening with, with reality. Um, the, the second step is to look at a, a couple of what I call here world-returning philosophies. So again, I, I stay in the domain of philosophy because I think there are philosophers who have seen this problem and have been trying to figure out how can we bring the world back in. Um, John Dewey, who was also mentioned earlier today, is, I think, a really interesting thinker in this regard, who was sort of ahead of, of, of his time in philosophical discussions by claiming that um, experience is, is real. And there he, he goes against Kant, who actually says, well, experience is just our experience, but whether there is a world beyond our experience, we, we cannot know. And Dewey steps in, in somewhere else. Um, 
there is a lot of detail, but I'll, I'll skip that. But he makes one interesting point, and he, he actually calls this the, with capital letters, philosophical fallacy, that he says the, the big mistake of modern philosophy is that we equate what we know with what is real. And he says that's, that's a problematic idea, because if we see that we can know differently, then suddenly we get this question, so what then is this the real knowledge? Um, and Dewey makes an interesting move there by saying, uh, our knowledge is not about what is real, because what is real is what we experience. We don't need knowledge for that. Knowledge has to do with what we can do with our experience, whether we can rely on our experience. When something happens now, whether we can expect that maybe something will happen in the future. Um, so I think what's interesting about Dewey as a world returning philosopher is that he tries to bring the world back and, and pushes against a lot of modern philosophy that says we can no longer know whether this world exists outside of our mind. Um, the other world returning philosophers are the phenomenologists. Um, and I want to briefly look at some of them. And it's interesting that some people this morning already also said they have a connection with phenomenology. Because I think this is indeed also the ambition of phenomenologists to, to see, can we bring the world back in? Uh, Edmund Husserl did that with the famous phrase, back to the things themselves. Um, and that is interesting, at least to have that as a motto. Um, Martin Heidegger went one step further where he says, it's not just the, the things that we need to get back to, but also this marvelous fact that things exist. So he would say, if we really want to go back to the world, we need to go back to the fact that the world is a place of existence, where things exist in time and space, maybe, to put that quickly, but where also the human being is not a, a thing amongst other things, but where the human being itself exists. And again, I think it, it connects to the, the previous presentations as well. Um, he, he actually coins this German phrase, Dasein, where he says the human being is the one who is, is there, exists there. Um, so I know more about Heidegger than Husserl. So I would say what, what Heidegger is, is really doing is trying to bring the world back in, but not just as a, a set of objects, but in its existence, and to bring the human being again in as the one who exists in and with the world. Um, one of the problems with Heidegger is that he says the, the human being is, in a sense, the one who, who receives the world and has to care for the world. And Heidegger has difficulty to, to know when to close the door and when to open the door. Um, and I think some of the, the political problems he ended up in himself had to do with the fact that he was struggling to find a criterion for what you let in from the world and where you push back. But he. He is also one of the philosophers who looks for really uh, to go beyond perspectivism. Um, and then another one who was mentioned, and I have to apologize for all these old white men in suits. <laughs> I didn't wear a suit, but apart from that, I'm also old and white. This says more about how we create and recreate our, our our histories, so there is a, a worry there. I think Emmanuel Levinas is, is an important figure 
in this as well because he also pushes back against perspectivism, against this idea that as an individual we stand before the world and in a sense we stand before time and then we begin to look at the world and perceive the world and talk about the world and, and create knowledge about the world. And the question Levinas asks is, but where does this individual actually come from? And he criticizes a lot of modern philosophy for saying it always assumes that the individual is there and that the task for the individual is to get knowledge of the world or to be responsible for the world. And Levinas looks for a, a, a different way to, to raise those questions. And there I think he, he criticizes, what was it, maximum hermeneutics? This idea that we are there safely outside of the world and then we begin to interpret the world. That's actually a strange perspectivist setup. But also a lot of thinking about knowledge always assumes there is already a knower and then how can the knower get knowledge of the world. It doesn't make sense, you can say, as soon as you are in education or work with young children because young children are not born as individuals who then uh, need to develop a perspective on the world. They, they enter in a soup and that soup is a mess and at some point something happens. And I think what Levinas does, for example, under this heading, ethics as first philosophy, he is not saying we should be responsible or we should be ethical. But he's saying something else, which has beautifully been sort of articulated by Sigmund Baumann in a big book on Levinas, where there is one phrase where he says, the point of Levinas is that he says, responsibility is the first reality of the self. Responsibility is the first reality of the self. And there he makes an existential point. So of course babies are bored and they have bodies and they have perception and they can be affected and they have emotions and feelings. But the, the awareness that you are a self, that I am not you, that Levinas says is an awareness that, that emerges when we encounter responsibility. Where you get this rabbit in your hands and you suddenly realize it's up to me to care for this animal. That you can say is the moment where the, the self arrives in the world. And these are little moments because it's very easy to, to forget that moment and drift into another mode again. And I think a lot of what you said, Sheila, this morning about reflexivity and, and awareness and not forgetting yourself or the whole transformation of professionalism as a kind of professional forgetfulness. Uh, this all speaks to this moment of where you realize it's up to me in this situation. So you can say myself becomes an issue for me when I encounter a responsibility. And encountering that is also encountering your freedom, but in a very different way from the, the freedom of the, the observer. You can say you, you encounter the, the freedom to, to do what only you can do. And that's a very different freedom. Levinas calls it a difficult freedom. But you can say, well, that's actually a freedom that's worthwhile. The neoliberal freedom is the freedom of choice or the freedom of shopping. But at some point, we have been shopping so much. And if that's all there is in life, then I think that's not the freedom to to live for. Um, there is more world returning in phenomenology. Um, and here is an author I really like, Jean-Luc Marion, um, who says, yeah, Husserl is right, we need to go back to the things themselves. Heidegger is even more right that we need to go back to the the being of the things. But then he says they both forget that 
something needs to happen before that, namely the phenomenon that things are given to us. Uh, think of the Lingus quote earlier, or talk about interruption. You weren't interrupted, by the way, which was interesting. We're all very polite and we know how to behave ourselves. Um, but givenness, you can say, is, is a part of what is it, human existence, that precisely refers to the things that are not in our control, but that cross our, our life path, whether we want it or not. Um, like rabbits or other human beings. Um, I think, so yeah, uh, Marion, there's very interesting things there. He has this phrase, everything that shows itself must first give itself. Very interesting observation. But then he also says, we shouldn't assume that behind everything that is given to us, there is this big giver in the sky who is handing out all this to us. So he says, something that's really given gives itself from itself, um, which is bizarre and interesting at the same time. Um, and there he's pushing back against the idea that we look for, but what is behind that? What does it mean that this happens in my life? Um, and it, it goes back to the whole question, what does it mean to, to live your life rather than to, to figure out why everything is happening? Um, so I think he also, as, as other phenomenologists, push back against this idea of a cognitive worldview or perspectivism where the individual is before the world. I particularly like Marion because I also think that teaching um, is a gift. Um, and a lot of talk about education reduces that gift to learning and, and forgets that to learn is for you to grasp and to teach is to be given something. Um, so I have only five minutes given to bring this to a conclusion. Um, <clears throat> now to, to live in a world that gives itself to us is not that you just sit in a chair and, and see what comes. Um, Marion used a, very, used a very interesting example of a painting somewhere. Um, and the, the painting uses the principle of anamorphosis. And I don't know whether you know it. About 20 years, it was a craze that you had all these books with pictures. And the pictures looked like nothing. And then you put a silver reflective cone in the middle. And when you look in the cone, suddenly that picture reveals itself. And Marion uses that as, as an example of what it means to live in a world of givenness, where he says, actually, this painting, in order to see the painting, you need to move around to find a position from which suddenly you can see that painting. And that's a position that is determined by the painting, not by you. So it's not your interpretation. But you have to do work to find the place where the picture sort of can, can find you. And that's a very different way to think about what it means to exist, not as the one who has the perspective from where everything can be overseen, but the one who actually moves around to, to find what, what the world is, is trying to give. And the world can give beautiful things, but the world also throws out a lot of shit upon us. And again, we have no choice. We, we have to encounter that. And then the, I think the real existential question is, do we stay there when that comes to us, or do we run away from it? And again, we cannot decide that in advance. If you want to decide that in advance, you have to stay on the run for the rest of your life. Uh, never uh, taking the risk that something will surprise you. 
Um, has that got anything to do with education? I think so. And this is my uh, almost last hero I want to, to bring to the table, um, a German scholar, Klaus Brange, who, um, who says if we really want to get what education is, we shouldn't start with asking what education is for, because then you get this whole range of answers like it's for employability or it's for well-being or it's for citizenship or it's always for the future. But he, he says we should start by looking at the, the unique form of education, because in the form of the practice there is something important. And he says, what, what is education? Um, you can say it's the art of redirecting someone else's attention. That's not a technology, it's an art, um, but that's what we do. And, and Pagan says that means that the basic gesture of education is to point by saying, hey, you there, look there. Um, pointing has a double character because in one and the same move it invites attention to go in a particular direction and with power point we, we do that all the time. But we also say you have a look there, you have a look there. So you can say in that one gesture we bring the, the world and the subject together in, into play. Now there is bad education that wants to control the attention of students, say you're only allowed to look there, and that also wants to control what students do with that by saying you're only allowed to give the right answer and if you give the wrong answer then you get a low mark or you fail. That's sort of this kind of image, but even if we fix the head of our students we cannot control what they will do with where their attention goes. And that's where Pranger says in the gesture of pointing you can already see sort of an, an anticipation on the, the freedom of the student that we invite students to say hey you pay attention there but it's up to you to figure out what you will do with what you meet there. And I think for me that's sort of the the truly educational thing that can happen there. Um, Simona Weil somewhere, this is the first woman in the, the picture show, uh, has this nice idea where she said actually a, a pedagogy of attention needs to have three steps. The first is indeed this whole challenge, how do we get the attention of our students? In a sense, it, it's a miracle, particularly if the students don't want to come to school in the first place. <laughs> so it starts at that very fundamental level. And of course, a, a lot of schools are also not interested in students, but just in, in something else. So students are good at, at perceiving that and saying, well, if that's the game, then there is no point for me to be there. Um, but then she says, once we, we, have, we are in attention to the world, she says what it requires from us is to, to pay attention with intellectual humility, and I really like that phrase. We need to do intellectual work, but with humility, not to say, oh, we already know what we are finding here. And then she says, ultimately, the third step is that of discernment, where it's for each of us in freedom to figure out what is this moment asking of me. Um, and I think you can do much more with this than with 500 pages of John Hattie visible learning, for those of you who <laughs> know about that. Um, then you can say, how about authority? And that's my last point, and it has something to do again with, with reality. Because as Tim also said, there is a, a danger in education that the, the teacher is the one who claims the authority over the student. 
that's really problematic. It turns education quickly into indoctrination or control. Many teachers experience that problem, but I think the solution for that is to say, I have nothing to give. I am only a facilitator of your learning. I'm just dancing around you, but I, I could not be here as well. And I think that gives up on, on education as well. You can say that the, the beauty and the interesting thing about education is that it's a triadic relationship. It's not teacher-student, because that always causes trouble, but it's teacher-student world. And what teachers do all the time is saying to students, the world. There may be something there for you to pay attention to. There may be something there that, that knocks on your door and something for you to do. And that's very nicely captured in this quote from Bertolt Brecht, who says the, the position of the teacher is a temporary position. At some point, every teacher must learn how to stop teaching when the time comes. And he says that's the most difficult thing, because to be a teacher is a very addictive position to be in for all these reasons that the students are there. And it's lovely to just think that they are there for you. But of course, you are there for, for the, the world. Only a few are able, when the time is right, to allow reality to take their place. And I think that's really profound to say that's ultimately where we need to come back to. Uh, because reality is not just where we live our lives, but reality also gives us all the, the things and, and calls us into our own freedom. That's what I wanted to put on the table, and hopefully it, uh, it does something. And I've taken more time than I should have been taken. Thanks very much.